Good morning. Thank you for joining us this Sunday morning at Colonial Hill Baptist Church. I'm Ernie Armstrong, and it's my privilege to lead in Bible study this morning from Colonial Hill. Today's lesson is taken primarily from uh, chapter 5, and we're going to fo focus on the first five verses of uh, chapter 5 from the book of Micah. <clears throat> And thus, we are continuing to look at a very bleak time in the history of Israel and Judah. Uh, we have been studying from four minor prophets, Amos, Jonah, Hosea, and Micah. Uh, and they have been prophesying uh, that uh, God's word, God is... Uh, telling them through these prophets, and by the way, minor refers to the length of the book, not to the importance of the uh, prophet. Uh, God is prophesying through these prophets of a coming judgment on the land of Israel, the northern ten tribes, and Micah is a resident of the southern uh, nation of the southern two tribes called Judah. And so uh, <clears throat> his prophecy is applied to Judah, uh, maybe even more so than Israel. He is a contemporary of the other prophets that is about living about the same time, including Isaiah. Um, the prophecy, the coming judgment will be uh, carried out uh, in great part because of the sins of the people, the rejection of God, and uh, as seen in the worship of idols, uh, a, a turning from God, a disobedience to the Ten Commandments themselves. Um, but as we will see in today's lesson, God still promises um, a redemption, a restoration, uh, and specifically that he will send one who would bring brighter days ahead, not only for them, but also for us and all who will, would and will humble themselves and believe on him, the Messiah, the Christ. Let's, look for, let's get some sense of the bleakness that the people of uh, Israel and Judah are looking at. Uh, Micah, as a contemporary of these others, uh, is writing somewhere uh, 740, uh, maybe even at se uh, to 700 B.C. Uh, Israel may have already fallen by the time and Israel, the northern kingdom, may have already fallen to the barbaric uh, Assyrian Empire. Uh, <clears throat> the Assyrians attacked and took the people off into captivity, uh, uh, exposed them to brutal, uh, terrible treatment, as we looked at in part in last week's, in some of the week's, uh, preceding today. Um, the Assyrians also attacked Judah, the southern kingdom, and uh, attacked Jerusalem, the capital and the stronghold. Um, but uh, uh, really through God's intervention, they, they uh, withdrew from Judah. But Micah's prophecies and all of these prophecies include uh, foretelling of God's judgment against Judah. And we know um, a little over a uh, hundred years later, uh, the Babylonians will defeat the Assyrians and then will attack and conquer Judah and Jerusalem and carry uh, the Jewish people into exile. We'll look at some reference to that in today's prophetic uh, setting. Let's look, just, just to get some sort of a contextual idea of the bleakness that the uh, 
Israelites, the Judah, uh, the, the inhabitants of Judah, also called Jacob, uh, might have been suffering some context from our own history. If we look at the early days of the American Revolution, things looked very bleak. The young American army uh, had been routed at uh, Brooklyn Heights in the battle for New York. Uh, the British occupied the city, and the ragtag American army uh, basically had to retreat after retreat after retreat from the forces of the British. It was winter. They had almost no covering, no warmth, uh, no supplies, no ammunition. Many believed the young revolution was, a, was hopeless and about to be quashed. Not the same word as squashed, but uh, we don't have time for the nuances there. But God would send a very special man, George Washington, to pull off a, su a surprise attack on the British at Trenton, and the tide of the re revolution turned. God would use this special man, George Washington, to bring brighter days to the future for this land, this country. Now, we're going to see in chapter 5, in spite of all of the <clears throat> judgments uh, against Israel and Judah, the, uh, uh, Micah is prophesying the coming of the Messiah who would bring hope to them. Um, if we outlined the lesson this morning, we might uh, illustrate the difficulty, which we'll see in uh, verse 1. We will then look at the hope or the Messiah who is to come. And uh, we'll look at verses 2 through 5 to see that. And in there, we'll examine uh, his birth, Christ's birth, his person, and his work. Um, so let's begin there. Um, chapter 5, verse 1, Micah from the Old Testament. Marshal your troops, O city of troops, for a siege is laid against us. They will strike Israel's ruler uh, on the cheek with a rod. Some translations say they will strike Israel's judge on the cheeks with a rod. But that term used in the Old Testament that we translate judge uh, really is talking about ruler. The book of Judges in the Old Testament is really not talking about judges in the sense of those who sit in a trial court or an appellate court, but instead the rulers uh, of, the, of the people. And so they will strike Israel's ruler. The New International Translation that I read from uh, goes ahead and translates that word judge to ruler. They will strike Israel's ruler on the cheek with a rod. Um, let's look uh, just a moment. Um, A siege is laid against us. Um, Micah might be talking about the attempt on the part of the Assyrians after having destroyed the northern ten kingdoms to come and attack Jerusalem. <clears throat> and that could have occurred during the life that did occur during the life of of Micah, and therefore that might be what he is referring to. But uh, many think the verse one is talking about Judah now, and so the siege laid against us would uh, easily be could easily be uh, prophetically referring to uh, the Babylonian attack against Jerusalem and uh, the area that surrounds it. The Babylonians eventually captured and destroyed Jerusalem. And we referenced last, uh, in last week's lesson uh, how they will literally plow the ground uh, where the temple uh, existed. During that time of attack against Jerusalem and the defeat of Jerusalem, 
Many Judeans were killed. <clears throat> Their leaders were executed. Zedekiah the king uh, was taken captive, and he had his sons killed before his very eyes. And then he was blinded. It was as if, not as if, it was the Babylonians' um, cruelty to say, the last thing you will see is your children being uh, slain before you. And then, of course, uh, thousands uh, of uh, Judeans, Jewish uh, residents of the southern kingdom were carried off into captivity into Babylon. Certainly, these were the darkest days ever in Judah's history. Uh, verse, uh, the last half of that verse, they will strike Israel's ruler on the cheek with a rod. Um, we've already talked that ruler is translated is the translation in New International. That's probably the accurate idea, but many translations say strike the judge on the cheek. Um, so it, uh, it's probably referring to the king of Israel slapping the ruler on the uh, cheek uh, is a form of insult, if not injury. And uh, the foretelling, the prophecy is uh, the even the rulers, the leaders would be uh, either killed or imprisoned uh, or in uh, Zedekiah's instance, blinded as well. Uh, by the way, there are some who see this phrase, they will strike Israel's ruler on the cheek with a rod, <clears throat> to be a reference, a prophecy of Jesus who would be smitten for our sins. <clears throat> I don't think that is... Uh, the actual meaning here, <clears throat> but I wanted to mention that there are some uh, scholars, and I certainly am not a scholar, I'm a reporter, uh, who, uh, 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 this is just a, a foretelling <clears throat> of what was going to happen during the Babylonian um, siege, uh, conquer, conquering and captivity that follows. <clears throat> Pardon me. This is, all of this is uh, somewhat symbolic of the dark times that uh, the people were experiencing, temporal and spiritual. As I've already said, they've, uh, God's condemnation uh, of them was largely because of their worship of idols and the grossness of uh, some of their other sins. <clears throat> A picture of spiritual darkness, quite frankly, that oppresses all of us. We are all in the darkness of sin. We're separated from God by our disobedience to him. Uh, sin means the word sin means missing the mark. The mark is God's standard. And if we fail to live by his standards, we engage in sin. Uh, that by itself separates us from God. Romans uh, 3.23 says, uh, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then Romans 6.23 uh, tells us that the wages of sin is death. So we've all sinned, and the outcome of sin is death. Our outlook, just like Judah's, was bleak before the hope presented and described in these next few verses of a Messiah. And with the hope illustrated in these passages and the faith in, uh, in our Savior, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Only then do we have uh, the promise 
of restoration with God. Um, our second point of today's lesson uh, looks at verses 2 through 5 of chapter 5, where Micah is prophesying about the coming of the Messiah. Uh, he says in verse 2, But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come from me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose or origins are from of old, from ancient times. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor gives birth and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord and the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be their peace. When the Assyrians invade our land and marches through our fortresses, we will raise against him seven shepherds, even eight leaders of men. Let's pause and look at uh, what he's talking about. Back to verse 2. Bethlehem Ephratha. Uh, I have discovered uh, the internet. And when I come across a difficult Jewish name or reference in the Old Testament in particular to a name that I can't figure out how to pronounce it, I just Google pronounce and I put in that name. Uh, the PH is, uh, is uh, pronounced as an F. Ephratha is the name here. So what does all of that mean? Well, some think it's just another name for Bethlehem. Bethlehem means, Beth means uh, the house of. And so Bethlehem is the house of bread. Ephrathum, Ephratha uh, means fruitful. And so it basically, uh, uh, Micah is saying, from this fruitful house of bread, Bethlehem, even though a small town and small community of unimportance, it is David's home, uh, King David's, the greatest Jewish king, um, but it had become a small, insignificant town, sort of like Nazareth uh, when, that we see in the New Testament where Jesus lived with his parents. Uh, insignificant. But let's look at these verses, the prophecy of the coming Messiah who will bring better days for the people. What do these verses tell us? They tell us that he will come from Bethlehem. Um, he will be a ruler in Israel. And he will be from the days of eternity. Now, we're going to touch on that as well. In just a uh, just a moment, uh, his his birth. <clears throat> He's from. He will be born in Bethlehem, uh, the Messiah, the Savior, will come out of Bethlehem. Now, the people uh, of the New Testament know that that the Messiah is going to come from Bethlehem. Uh, just think of the Christmas story, Matthew uh, chapter 2, when the ma Magi asked the scribe where the Christ was to be born. They didn't hesitate. They said, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written in the prophet. And they quoted this verse, Micah chapter 5, verse 2. So this was well known and quoted, everyone knew the Messiah would come from Bethlehem. Um, 
predictions. Micah, as I mentioned earlier, uh, lived around 740 B.C. to 700 or into the 680 uh, B.C. As you count forward by counting backwards, uh, because we're going down to 1 or 2 or 3 B.C. Uh, when Christ is born. But he is predicting that the Messiah will come from Bethlehem 700 years in advance. <clears throat> we don't do very good with predictions. Uh, our recent elections, there was a prediction of a red wave in the 2022 elections. That did not come to pass. Um, this week's <clears throat> football uh, prognostications, predictions by experts uh, will predict winners and losers, but they're rarely on target. And I hope you don't do anything with their predictions <clears throat> uh, from a gambling standpoint. Uh, certainly, we do not predict the weather uh, very good. Uh, there recently was a prediction in Texas of a 100% chance of rain. It didn't rain. So what is the point? It is the miracle, the majesty of Micah's prediction. 700 years in advance, he predicted that the Messiah, the ruler over Israel, would be born in Bethlehem. And Jesus was born in Bethlehem. 700 years in advance, and everyone knew it. They even quoted it to the Magi, quoted Micah, uh, 700 years later when the Magi came searching uh, for the Messiah. Uh, we need to be aware and give credence to the miracle of prediction. Now, uh, let's also look at these verses on the sub, second subtopic, the person of the Messiah. Uh, the person of the one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Um, John chapter 1 verse 1, and maybe verse 2, uh, the, the Gospel of John says, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And verse 2 says, And through him all things were made. By the way, uh, next, <clears throat> next quarter, beginning our first Sunday in December, our study will leave the Old Testament and we will spend two quarters looking at and studying from the book of John. Uh, frankly, I'm looking forward to uh, what some think is the greatest book in the Bible, uh, the book of John. In John 8, Jesus himself says, Before Abraham came into being, I am. He pre-existed Abraham. His goings out were from eternity. So Jesus fulfilled uh, this Micah chapter 5 passage about the Messiah being the one who was from long ago, from eternity. Uh, it's important for us to, from time to time, remind ourselves that the, what the Bible teaches about the person and work of Christ. Um, many of the difficulties, even heresies, from church history have involved a misunderstanding about the person of Christ, <clears throat> saying either he is not God or he is not man or some other misunderstanding 
about his nature. But this passage for our study today emphasizes the right belief about Christ. He is 100% God, but also 100% man. He had to be both to bring about our salvation. <clears throat> and the illustration that he is 100% God is he's, his going forth, that's coming uh, to this earth from Bethlehem or through this town of Bethlehem or from the days of eternity, from days of old. Jesus didn't come in, just come into being in, the, in Bethlehem. No, his goings forth are from eternity. He is eternal. He is God himself, God the Son. And that's what John chapter 1, verse 1 is saying. In the beginning was the Word. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So Jesus existed before anything was created. In fact, he is the one who made everything. Um, also, verse 3, notice what it says, what Micah says about the work of Christ. Uh, verse 5 says, And he will be their peace. Um, Isaiah, who was a contemporary, lived at the same time and wrote his prophecies uh, at the same time as Micah, said that he would be called the Prince of Peace. Ephesians chapter 4, Paul writes, For he himself is our peace. Jesus made peace for us with God by his death on the cross. Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So Jesus, once again, fulfilled this prophecy of Micah by making peace for us with God. And he does so and did so through his death on the cross. So this is a great passage from Micah on both the person and the work of the Messiah. He was a real man, 100% man, he was born in Bethlehem as a child, a human child is born. But as we've been illustrating, he was also 100% God because he had existed from before eternity. If that, uh, hard to get a grasp around that concept. Um, his great work, his great purpose was fulfilled in his death on the cross and dying for our sins, paying that price that uh, Romans talks about, the wages of sin is death. <clears throat> Jesus paid that price, thus making peace for us with God. Um, our our study this morning also looks at uh, a couple of verses out of chapter 4, uh, and while this is not in chronological order, let's look real quickly at verses 6 and 7 of chapter 4. In that day, declares the Lord, I will gather the lame, I will assemble the, assemble the exiles, and those I have brought to grief. I will make the lame a remnant those driven away a strong nation. The Lord will rule over them in Mount Zion from that day and forever. Uh, the lame and the outcasts, they're, they're, that's spiritually speaking. Uh, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The poor in spirit are those who realize that they are spiritually deficient. Uh, they have sinned against God. And 
They have no hope of heaven without his mercy and grace. And so they call on him to save them through Jesus. That's every one of us. And whether we spend eternity in the presence of God and Christ himself will depend on whether we accept that, acknowledge our sinfulness and our unworthiness before God himself, and instead accept the grace gift Jesus provides us through his death on the cross. Um, only the spirit, only the poor of spirit will have the kingdom of heaven. And so each of us must humble ourselves and admit our sin and ask Christ to save us. Have you asked Christ to save you? Have you acknowledged your sin? Be willing to repent and repent and trust in him, have faith in him. As we studied in uh, a recent lesson, Acts, uh, I think it's 2021. 20, it's not in today's lesson, so I'm going from memory. Uh, Paul says, I teach you that you must have repentance and faith in Christ Jesus. Um, we must come to the, stat, the position of acknowledging that we aren't able by ourselves. We need help to be in God's presence. And that means accepting Jesus, accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Have you? If so, you will be with Christ in eternity with all others who have accepted him as Lord and Savior. Micah, a special prophecy from the Old Testament, has formed a great study for us and pointed us in the direction of Jesus. Thank you for studying with us this morning. Let me invite you to continue to worship with us here at Colonial Hill Baptist Church. Thank you and good morning.